this project I'm going to be making this mitre cornered box. In order to show that you don't need a large workshop equipped with expensive machines I'm going to build this box using just the basic hand tools available to a novice woodworker. The project's quite involved so I'm splitting it into two videos and in this first video I'll build the main frame of the box and the lid. The side of the box is going to be beech with a American walnut top and splines and some 4mm plywood for the base. I measure a length of beech long enough to supply one end and one side. Using a square and a knife I make this mark across the whole width of the board. With a chisel I cut towards the knife mark. This provides a groove that will help to guide the saw whilst cross cutting the wood. Using the groove as a guide to get started I cut the board to length using a tenon saw. The material I'm using is 19mm or 3 quarters of an inch thick and so I can get two sides of the box out of this one piece by resawing it down the middle. I set my marking gauge so that I can make a mark down the centre of the edge of the board. To check that the marking gauge is set up correctly I make a mark from one side of the board and then another from the other side. If the marks match up then I know that the gauge is set correctly. I then use the gauge to mark the centre line all around the outside edge of the board. Using a handsaw I use the centre line as a guide to saw the wood into two equal pieces. This process is known as resawing, and usually you do something like this on a bandsaw but I wanted to prove that it could be done using hand tools only. It's important to get this cut as accurate as possible so I spend a lot of time making sure that I'm following the lines correctly. I start the cut by working in from one corner. Once this initial cut is established I reposition the wood in my vise so that I can cut along the top. I start the cut at the opposite corner. Once that's established I drop the back of the saw to line it up with the initial cut and start to saw across the top of the board. It's now just a process of working along the board. As I go I keep checking that the saw is following the lines of my initial marks. It's easier to follow the guide along the length of the board rather than the end and so I'll keep repositioning the board within the vise to take advantage of this. Of course I'm making a lot of work for myself here. In an ideal world I'd make the box out of material that was the correct thickness to start with. I'm a great believer in the practice of dimensioning a job based on the material available but the simple fact is it's not always possible or economical to source material in the ideal thickness. As I get towards the end of the cut I flip the material over and come in from the other side. I've placed popsicle sticks in the void to act as spacers. This stops the two halves of the board being squashed together by the vise and keeps them parallel. And there we go. That was hard work, but worth it. So this process has left a lot of rough and ugly saw marks along the length of the cut and also despite my best efforts the saw did drift away from the mark from time to time. So I need to neaten them up and I'm going to use this little jig here to do some planing. Using this jig I butt the work against the edge and this allows me to plane without the job moving. 
This silicon matting is pretty good at stopping the job from sliding around and holding it steady. Sometimes however I prefer to use double sided tape. With this little jig I've made a couple of different extension pieces so I can deal with different heights of board. The rail along the edge of the jig clamps in my vise to keep everything steady. First of all I use my plane to get the worst of the tool marks off and to get the board somewhere near flat. I'm using my number 4 smoothing plane here. As well as being my favourite plane, it's also the size that is most likely that a new woodworker or someone with a limited amount of tools is going to possess because it's really quite versatile. With the boards now basically flat, the next job is to make them uniform. The thicknesses are fairly close, but due to the resawing process, there is one board that is thinner than the other. So we'll use this as a guide for the final thickness. Starting with the thinner of the two boards, I'll mark up any high spots and then use the plane to flatten these. Using the edge of the plane as a reference surface, I'll check for and mark up any high spots that still remain. I could use winding sticks here to check that the board is level, but on this project I used another method. I set my gauge to reference what appears to be the thinnest part of the board, and then check the thickness all the way around. This process allowed me to find a high spot at the top corner of this board which I can then take out with the plane. I can then use the gauge to check that I've got that to the right height now. And to go around the outside of the board again and reassure myself that everything's the same thickness. However the main reason for using the gauge is that I can now transfer that mark onto the slightly wider board that gives me a reference for how thick this needs to end up. I can then plane down to this thickness, using the gauge marks to make sure that I've got the right thickness at the edge, and using the edge of the plane to make sure I haven't got any high spots in the middle. Eventually I get to the point where I'm happy that both boards are the same thickness. The closer the boards are to being uniform, the easier it's going to be later on. It'll be very difficult to get the box completely square if the boards aren't uniform. The last job is to get the last few tool marks and scratches out, and I do this using a card scraper. It's a really simple tool but very effective. Maintaining a good cutting edge on a card scraper is very important. Fortunately it's quite a simple skill to learn and there are plenty of videos on YouTube to show you how to do this. A well sharpened card scraper should leave shavings like this. If you're just getting a pile of dust then you need to resharpen. After scraping I've got a nice smooth surface across my boards. I decide on the orientation of the boards and mark up the bottom edge. This is where the plywood bottom is going to go. And above that the walnut lid. I want to cut a recess for the walnut lid to live in. I'm going to use my 6mm or quarter inch chisel to do this. But looking at the thickness of the walnut it means that I'm going to have to do some more resawing. First however I'm going to mark and cut the housing in the boards. 
I'm using my mortise gauge, which is a regular marking gauge except it has two pins that can be adjusted. I set the gap between the two pins to be the same width as the chisel. And then I'll use the chisel again to mark the distance from the gauge to the first pin. I then use the gauge to mark where the housing or dado is going to be cut. I'm going to use my knife and a steel ruler just to make these marks a little deeper. I'm going to be relying on the marks as the edge of the housing or dado so I want them to be as crisp as possible. I then use my chisel to start removing the waste material. I start at one end and then start chiselling. I place the chisel at a slight angle with the bevel facing the surface of the board. By placing my fingers towards the cutting edge I can guide the chisel making it easier to place but also control the depth more easily. I tap fairly lightly on the chisel with my mallet. I work steadily along the length of the marks occasionally stopping to brush out some of the waste material. I then work in from the end to remove more material and to flatten the bottom. I use a gentle yet controlled and deliberate action on the chisel. I repeat this process along the entire length of the board. This can make your fingers feel a little fatigued until you get used to it. I want the housing to be a little bit deeper so I use my knife and steel ruler to deepen the edges. I then use the chisel to cut down to depth. I rotate the board when necessary so that I can work in from the other side. It doesn't take too long to get down to depth. I place the board in a vise and then work along the length of the housing to get everything nice and neat. I use the knife to cut into the edges of any stubborn bits. And with a final pass along the length of the board with a chisel that's pretty much this part of the job complete. However if you have one you could use a miniature router plane like this to make sure that everything's the same depth all the way along. Here's a cheaper alternative which is just a piece of wood with a wedge and a blade. It's not really necessary for this job but I'll show the principle. The blade is set to depth and then the wedge tapped in. 
By planing along the length of the housing, or dado, we can ensure that it's the same depth all the way across. This is a little bit more fiddly than the expensive router plane, but if you have a job that absolutely needs a guaranteed uniform depth all the way along, this is a nice cheap way of achieving it. However, for this job it isn't absolutely necessary. And that's the housing, or dado, completely cut and ready. Next I want to prepare the bottom edge of the board to receive the plywood base. Rather than cut a housing, I'm just going to cut a recess into the bottom. Using a gauge I'm going to mark the depth I need for the plywood. I'm using my mortise gauge here, but it has a single pin on the reverse side, so in this mode it's actually just a normal marking gauge. Having marked up the inside face of the board, I'm now going to make a matching mark along the bottom edge. With the tenon saw at a slight angle, I saw gently along this marking gauge line to get the cut started. Once I have a nice straight initial cut, I adjust my saw so it's perfectly perpendicular to the edge of the board and cut down until I meet the depth of the internal mark. I place my hand on the saw plate and the face of the board in order to help guide. When I'm down to depth, I rotate the board in the vise. It's important not to over tighten the vise here, because it will introduce bowing in the board. Again I start with the saw at an angle to start the cut and then I move the saw perpendicular to the face of the board to make a nice square cut. And that's that material removed. With the housings for both the lid and the base of the box now cut, I can now cut the boards to length. I'm going to get one side and one end out of each board. I mark this up with a square and knife as before. Chisel in to help guide the saw for the cross cut. And then make the cut to get my side and end pieces. I've already cut the housings in my other board, and so this needs cutting to length too. I use the end piece I've just cut to mark the correct length on the second board. I then mark, chisel, and saw as before. I now have the basic pieces for my box frame, and they'll be arranged something like this. Now these boards currently have square ends, and so we're going to use this jig to cut 45 degree mitres along each edge. The jig is essentially a shooting board that angles the plane at 45 degrees. By moving the plane along the guide and feeding the work into it, 
we cut a 45 degree angle on the edge of the board. On my channel you can find a video that shows how to construct this jig using hand tools only. I've set my plane to make quite a shallow cut, which makes everything quite neat and predictable. I've clamped the jig to my workbench for stability, and I keep feeding the job into the plane until I've cut a 45 degree angle right across the edge. Something like that. I then start to cut the second board in exactly the same way. I offer up the two boards to see how they fit together. Because of my preference for using this jig in a right handed way, there are going to be some times when the plane is pushing up against the edge of the housing. It's possible that the action of the plane could cause this end to tear out, so to avoid this I'm going to put a 45 degree mark in the top of this board and then just remove some of the excess with a chisel. I then go ahead and cut all the remaining mitres. Most project videos showing a mitre cornered box build will use a power saw of some description to cut the 45 degree angles, but this jig really is very simple to build and is very effective. In order for the finished box to be built square, it's essential that the opposite faces are the same length as each other. In order to ensure this, I put the opposite sides back to back against each other. I can then mark up any overlap on one board and use the mitre jig to slowly sneak up on this and cut it to the exact length. With all the edges mitered, the box comes together something like this. Next, I need to prepare the lid. First, I need to take a measurement between the bottom of the housing or dado at each end of the box. This will give me the maximum length for the lid. I mark this up on my walnut and then cut it to length using the usual method. I mark up the edges of the walnut board in the same way as I did with the beech, ready for resawing. And I split my board in the same way as I did before. As before, I use the plane to get both boards flat and of uniform thickness. And I finish off with the card scraper to get everything nice and smooth. I'm going to glue these two boards together along the edge to make the required width of the lid. I spend some time reorienting the boards until I find what I think is the most pleasing arrangement of the figure. I plane the joining edges of the boards together to make them nice and square. And next I glue the boards together. I move the boards back and forwards against each other to spread out the glue evenly and wipe away any excess. I then clamp the boards together. The job of the clamps is to ensure that the boards are held nicely together while the glue goes off, not to force them together by clamping them as hard as possible. 
Overclamping is also likely to introduce a cup or bow into the finished piece and this will need sorting out with some more planing. With that nicely held I'll leave it to dry overnight. With the glue dry I can remove the clamps and see what we've got. I use a plane to ensure that the board is flat across its entire surface and also to remove any glue marks. And then I'll do a final card scraping for smoothness. Walnut looks really nice when it's finished so it's worth making the effort now to get it as smooth as possible. That way it's going to look as good as it possibly can in the finished piece. And that looks pretty good. Next I'm going to do a dry assembly of the box so I can fit the lid. I'll use paper tape to hold the box in position. And then I'll check that everything comes together nice and square. The lid is currently wider than it needs to be so I want to measure it up to cut off the excess. To look at its best I want the seam to run bang down the middle of the box and so I'm going to cut off excess from both sides. With the centre seam in position I mark up the width of both sides so that the lid will fit into the dado or housing. This means the width I'm marking is about 3 eighths of an inch wider than the internal diameter of the box. Using a square I mark this width along the entire length of the lid on both sides. I then use a knife to score it. I could use a plane to remove this excess material and get the lid down towards its required width but I want to use these offcuts later in the project to provide the material for the splines. I cut the lid slightly wide on purpose and use a plane just to get to the final width as it allows for more precision and a more refined edge. I also use the plane to get the lid to its final length. Planing across the end grain is a delicate operation it's very easy to tear out or chip off the trailing corner. I guard against this in three ways. Firstly I make sure that the cutting edge on my plane is very sharp. Secondly I set the plane nice and shallow so I'm not taking off too much material in one go. Thirdly I never plane across the entire width of the board. I start from one end and plane towards the middle then rotate the board and come back in from the other side. And that's the lid at about the right dimensions. Now the depth of the lid is currently too wide to fit within the housing or dado 
but this is intentional as the finished lid will be reminiscent of a shaker style raised panel. The first step is to mark the depth of the dado or housing around the edge of the lid. This is the target thickness for the edge of the lid so that it will fit within the dado. Next I measure in about 2 cm or 3 quarters of an inch from each edge and mark the position. Using a square and pencil I use these measurements to draw a rectangle inset from the edge of the lid. I clamp the lid to the workbench and add an extra bit of paper tape just to stop it rotating. Then using the plane I work my way around the edge of the lid. I hold the plane at an angle and the aim is to put a bevel along the edge of the board. The final thickness of the board along the edge is to be in line with the gauge mark. The angle should then rise up from there towards the pencil line which is at the existing thickness of the board. Again I use a fairly shallow cut on the plane and take my time. It's a lot easier to take a little bit more material off than it is to try and put some back on if you've cut too deeply. When I've got somewhere close I'll offer up one of the edges and see if the lid will fit into the dado. It's still a bit tight here so I'll go back to the plane and take off a little bit more material. I'll repeat this process until I have a nice fit. Once the first edge is correct I'll repeat the process on the other three sides. When everything fits I'll work round the edges again just to make sure that I have a nice corner. Ideally I'd like a nicely defined line to run from the corner of the lid to the corner of the inset rectangle. With the lid about the right size I'll do a dry assembly to see how it all fits together. I use paper tape on the edges to keep everything together. That looks pretty good but I can't quite get the corners to come together. This is because the lid is a little bit too wide. So using my plane I'll make some small adjustments until the lid is a perfect fit. I'll also take the opportunity now to do some sanding as this will be a lot more difficult once the lid has been fitted. That looks pretty good now so I'm just going to do a final check for square. So now it's time to glue up. I use paper tape to help ensure that the corners come together. By lining up the edges like this and taping them together I can essentially fold the box together. Like so. I also put paper tape down the inside edges of each corner. This is to protect against glue squeeze out. With everything ready to go I add glue at the corners. I place the lid in position and then fold the sides of the box in.
a little bit more paper tape helps to hold things steady. I add glue to the last two corners and then position the last side. Note that I don't put any glue in the dado to hold the lid. I want the lid to float freely within the dado. This is to allow for expansion, which is particularly important as I'm using two different types of wood which will have different expansion rates. I hold everything in position with paper tape and then add a couple of clamps just to exert a little bit of pressure on the corners. I'll check for square throughout and make small adjustments. Band clamps are especially good for this kind of job but I wanted to stay on brief and not use anything out of the ordinary. I leave the box to glue up overnight and then remove the clamps and the tape. And that's it for this video. In the second and final video in this project we'll add the splines cut off the lid, add the base and do the finishing. And the finished piece will look like this. I hope you found this video useful. If you enjoyed it, check out my channel for other project videos. And if you enjoy them, subscribe to keep up to date.